In my video about the completion of the decomp, I said I probably wouldn't be making any more LEGO Island content for a while. But then someone set out to prove me wrong. One of the most common motivators behind a decompilation project is the prospect of porting a beloved game to PC. But LEGO Island is different. It is, and only ever has been, a PC game, and it can still technically run on Windows 11 with enough patience. But it is just barely holding together. Without help from mods and compatibility layers, it's virtually ripping apart at the seams. And so porting the game's codebase away from its aging Windows 95 and DirectX 5 infrastructure to something modern and cross-platform had been our dream ever since we started messing around with the game in 2019. Not just for improving playability on modern systems, though that was certainly a big part of it, but also just for the fun of seeing a game running on hardware you wouldn't expect it to. Is putting LEGO Island on the Wii practical? No. But is it cool as hell? Absolutely. And today, I'm incredibly pleased to announce that the vast majority of this work has been officially completed, with the game fully decoupled from its archaic foundations and capable of running on everything from modern Windows to Linux, Mac OS to iOS, and even completely inside an everyday web browser. And as far as we're concerned, this is only the beginning. We'll be talking about all of that and more after a message from our sponsor. If you're in need of a website and don't want to mess around with writing code or having to set up and maintain a server, then Squarespace is one of the easiest ways to do it. They have over a hundred templates to choose from, whether you need a website for an online store, portfolio, business, or blog, Squarespace has you covered and will get you up and running in no time. And if you need to make any customizations, their site editor is a breeze to use, so you can really give your website the personal touch it needs. I used Squarespace for my online store and loved just how easy it was to get a great looking result. It integrated immediately with everything that I needed it to, and it gave me peace of mind to know that my store was in good hands. So if you want a great looking website with no fuss, head over to squarespace.com slash mattkcbytes to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And now back to LEGO Island. Our first major pushes to make the decompilation more portable actually started very early on in the process. While we were primarily working with Microsoft's Visual C++ 4.2 compiler, almost from the very beginning, prominent team member Ma Ten was testing the code with GCC, a compiler widely used for various other platforms, especially Linux. While our priority was obviously matching the original code, we all knew the importance of being able to use modern compilers in the future, so we tried our best to keep both compilers happy with the decompiled code. MSVC, especially back then, was a lot less strict about following standards than modern GCC is, and there were times that something we decompiled would throw an error on GCC, but fixing it would break an otherwise perfect match on MSVC 4.2. In these scenarios, we would end up having to implement a piece of code twice, once the incorrect way that matched the original game, and once the correct way that would make GCC happy. We could then use a simple macro check so that the right code was used for the right compiler. At first, the GCC build couldn't really do much, because annoyingly, GCC and MSVC used different ABIs when compiling C++. That's a nerdy way of saying that while the frontend IL.exe had been fully decompiled by this point, if you then compiled it with GCC, it could not be used with the original game's LEGO 1.dll. It could only be used with a DLL also compiled by GCC, and we didn't have much of LEGO 1 for it to compile. But over time, that changed, and using other compilers became more and more viable. It may seem like a small thing, but it was actually pretty exciting for our very first taste of being able to do tangible, transformative things with the LEGO Island codebase. But using a modern compiler is not the same thing as modernizing the codebase. For all intents and purposes, LEGO Island was still stuck in the land of Windows 95 and DirectX 5, and we all knew that decoupling it from those would involve much more significant changes to the game's codebase. As such, prominent team member Foxticles figured we might as well get a head start, so in June 2024, about two-thirds of the way through the decomp, he started a side project called Isle Portable, dedicated to slowly eliminating Windows dependencies and replacing them with cross-platform ones. Some low-hanging fruit got picked off pretty quickly. LEGO Island uses the proprietary Smacker library from 1997 to play FMVs, and it was pretty straightforward to replace this with LibSmacker, a fully open source alternative. This was particularly straightforward because LEGO Island already had a wrapper class around Smacker called MXSMK, so only that needed to be modified to do this. However, Foxticles did have to slightly modify LibSmacker itself to play nicely with LEGO Island's proprietary interleaved streaming system, but that too was relatively minimal. Then the team started porting the more Windows-specific stuff over to SCL. Thankfully, these two were relatively minimal. I mean, all apps need to communicate at least a little with the host OS, but for games like LEGO Island, this is mostly limited to creating the window, receiving events like minimizing and closing, keyboard and mouse input, and multi-threading. 
All of these are readily available in SDL, which itself supports a wide variety of platforms. By porting to it, we effectively also port to those too. LEGO Island's configuration, normally stored in the Windows registry, was also moved into a simple ini file using the library libinipasser. A faithful remake of the LEGO Island config app was also made in Qt to provide a familiar cross-platform interface to this ini file. But while SDL does support audio, it does not support an audio feature that LEGO Island made extensive use of, 3D audio. When LEGO Island plays a sound effect or line of dialogue, it uses features in DirectX to make it sound like it's coming from a specific direction and distance. Oh, for goodness sakes, what in the blue bricks was I thinking? I forgot to tell you one more thing. If you want to help out in the pizzeria delivering Lego Island's tastiest comestibles, click on the pizzeria. Foxicles ended up utilizing a library called Mini Audio, which was extremely easy to integrate, being a self contained single header library with no other dependencies, and does a solid job of replicating the spatial sound effect. While there are some minor imperfections, its developers have been very responsive and willing to fix any problems we've encountered. At this point, we were already starting to see improvements in the game's behaviour. Over the years, we'd all gotten used to the original game's quirks, like how alt tabbing in and out of it can mess up the sound or make the whole game softlock, but with more modern code under the hood, this stuff simply went away. The infamous exit crash bug was also fixed in the process, as it was triggered by an oversight in the original game's event handler, and now with SDL, we had a whole new one. But then came the elephant in the room, the graphics. The game's 2D visuals, like its pre-rendered backdrops and FMVs, could largely be replaced with existing functionality in SDL, but its 3D was a lot more complicated. LEGO Island relies on an obsolete and obscure graphics API called Direct3D Retained Mode, something so rarely utilized Microsoft hasn't supported it since, well, since LEGO Island, really. The thing about D3DRM is it isn't just a 3D graphics API. By today's standards, it has more in common with a game engine like Unity or Godot. LEGO Island gives it textures and model data, but it's D3DRM that's responsible for building and maintaining the actual 3D world. As such, this couldn't be a simple one-to-one -one port from one subsystem to another. We would either need to write our own re-implementation of D3DRM, or rewrite a substantial amount of LEGO Island so it doesn't need that functionality anymore. D3DRM is relatively well documented, more so in books from the era than on the internet, so we knew it wasn't necessarily going to be difficult as much as it would be extremely time consuming. And having just finished a time consuming decompilation, we were all a little apprehensive to dive into D3DRM, even though we knew it was the last piece of the puzzle to making LEGO Island fully cross platform. The team ended up procrastinating for the next few months, instead working on ways to improve the decomp's accuracy while Isle Portable remained dormant. That is, until I made my video announcing the completion of the decomp. Fellow 90s game hacker Anders Jembo, known for his contributions to Devolution X, the modernized community version of Diablo, saw it, heard about our concerns about reworking D3DRM, and promptly decided to give it a go himself. With Anders taking the lead, Isle Portable was suddenly making rapid progress. Rather than making significant modifications to LEGO Island, his approach was to re-implement the Direct3D APIs that the game expected, essentially writing a translation layer from LEGO Island to more cross-platform libraries. This mirrors similar approaches used in other decoms like Super Mario 64, where ports frequently use a translation layer from the N64's fast 3D microcode, and apparently Devolution X2, where the translation layer was eventually absorbed into the game, cutting out the overhead of translation. At first, LEGO Island's translation layer was full of empty functions, just enough to get the game to compile without the real Windows and DirectX libraries present, but not enough to actually do anything. Even so, seeing little things like LEGO Island message boxes appearing on Linux and Mac OS was pretty wild having only ever seen them on Windows before. From here, Anders started plowing through the API, getting LEGO Island's 2D functionality ported over within just a few days of joining the project. This was the first time we'd ever seen the game rendered natively on another platform, you know, without wine. And as is customary with anything LEGO Island related, the first thing to render was the no CD video. Whoops, you have to put the CD in your computer. But we all knew 2D was the easy part. It was time to plunge into D3DRM, the no man's land that none of us had dared to go before. We were glad to finally have someone dedicating some time to this, but nothing could have prepared us for how quickly things would progress. Much like the decomp itself, major milestones started being hit on a near daily basis. Before we knew it, Anders had triangles showing on the screen, then meshes rendering, then textures, and then lighting. Within two weeks, we went from seeing practically nothing to seeing the whole island rendered with completely custom code. 
Seeing all of this come together so quickly was insane. We had all predicted several months or even years worth of further work to be done even after the decomp was complete, but no, it's like we all blinked and the hardest, most daunting part of the process was already done. That alone was exciting enough, but what was especially cool was the way Anders implemented the 3D code. The thing that really complicates implementing anything in 3D is that there is no one way to do it. If we wrote a D3DRM implementation in OpenGL, that's great, but there are a lot of devices out there that even OpenGL wasn't available on, and I was always concerned that anything we did might lock the game out from working on whatever platform we wanted. At first, Anders utilized SDL GPU, a new feature in SDL3 that abstracts rendering from Vulkan, Metal, and Direct3D 12. Yeah, you heard that right. LEGO Island can now render Vulkan, Metal, and Direct3D 12 more or less natively. But as cool as this was, I was also a little concerned. This is great for modernizing LEGO Island, but what about getting it to run on older systems or game consoles that never provided any of these newer APIs? Thankfully, Anders understood this too, and wrote his D3DRM implementation to be modular so that backend APIs could be easily written and swapped out with minimal changes to the rest of the game. He then went on to write a simple software rendering backend. LEGO Island was actually developed with software rendering in mind, since at the time GPUs were relatively rare. So while there is a performance hit to this, it's not as bad as you'd think, and the great thing about a software renderer is it will run on literally anything with a CPU. And finally, just to cover all of his bases, he wrote an OpenGL 1.1 backend, which is about as far back as you can go. This lays the groundwork for some pretty exciting stuff. We know there were early, abandoned plans to release LEGO Island on classic macOS. We could actually do that with the OpenGL 1.1 backend. And with the modern backend, the game has already been confirmed to be fully playable on not just every major desktop OS, but also modern smartphones. Yes, LEGO Island is now on iOS, of all things. While working on this video, he even wrote a DirectX 9 backend, specifically to make a backend compatible with RTX Remix. Yes, the Ray Trace LEGO Island memes are actually becoming real. But the biggest rite of passage for this whole LEGO Island decompilation was this. A web port of LEGO Island, something Foxtacles had been dreaming about since 2009. Having grown up with the game like many of us, Foxicles wanted to share the game with as many people as possible, and turning it into a web game was the most obvious way to do that. But back then, the web was a very different place. Internet multimedia was dominated by Flash, which didn't really make sense for a game like LEGO Island. And while Java might have been able to pull it off, without the source code, conversion into either of these was a dead end. While he briefly considered some kind of emulation-based approach, this also wasn't ideal because of the inherent overhead involved. It became clear that barring a release or leak of the original source code, decompilation was the only true answer, but it was way too much effort for one person to do on their own. Fast forward to 2025 and we have not only a complete decompilation, but now a relatively portable codebase. Not only that, we also have technologies like WebAssembly, WebGL, and WebGPU making near-native performance web games a very real thing. So after 16 years, it was time to make it real. Today, if you go to the web address isle.pizza, you will be greeted with a fully functional version of LEGO Island running entirely inside a web browser. It's actually pretty insane to see. While a web port of LEGO Island was not something that had ever occurred to me before, playing it now, I can absolutely see the vision. LEGO Island is a difficult game to set up today, to the extent that the LEGO Island wiki has a not insubstantial page devoted solely to getting the game running. Us veterans might be used to it, but asking the average person to deal with DLLs, mods, and compatibility settings just to get something playable is a bit much. But the fact that anyone with no more than an up-to-date web browser can type in a URL and start playing the game in seconds solves that problem completely. It's an incredible microcosm of just how far technology has come. Keep in mind this game was targeting only about 10 to 15 FPS on cutting edge machines of the time. And now it can run several times that speed in a web browser, even on a mobile phone. And Mindscape's infamous interleaved asset system that smoothly streamed media off the game CD ends up doing exactly the same thing here, except instead of a CD in your computer, it's streaming from a server thousands of miles away on the internet. Yet it all just works, which is honestly how it should be. The core decompilation team really believes this game is something special, but the only reason we do is because we actually got to play it when it worked. It's a real shame how much of a technical disaster it's become on modern computers, because it deserves to be preserved and playable for years to come. 
While we were able to help the situation a little with various mods and patches over the years, let's face it, it is still a lot of hoops to jump through that most people simply aren't going to want to do. So to have a version of the game that is this frictionless to experience is a truly incredible thing to see. Foxicles even added support for every language. Back in 1997, they could only fit one language onto each disc, so if you wanted a specific language, you had to track down the right disc. But on IL.Pizza, it's just a drop-down menu, and then the game automatically streams the correct assets to you. It doesn't get any easier than that. So just like that, the LEGO Island modding community is once again buzzing with activity. And big thanks to the team, and especially Anders Jembro, for pushing it through. If you're interested in checking it out, or perhaps contributing more, everything is available on GitHub and links are in the description. Now that the game is fully decoupled from Windows and DirectX 5, we couldn't be more excited to see what other ports come out of it. As we speak, people are working on more ports to systems like the PSP and the 3DS. Could the fabled Wii port finally be real after all this time? Anyways, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.